welcome. December 12th is the traditional feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this year, it was also Joy Sunday in the Advent calendar. I take great joy in bringing her story and the glimpse of the practices accompanying it to Luther today. Our Lady of Guadalupe is particularly beloved by many migrants, those fleeing violence and persecution. Many from Latin America keep her in their hearts throughout the dangerous desert crossing into the U.S., a trek that this year has already claimed more than 500 lives. Today, although we are not on the southern border, we are gathering on land that has been cherished and nurtured by Dakota peoples for centuries. Land that has seen them forcibly removed and crowded into desolate and impoverished places far from here. Our Lady of Guadalupe may not be a familiar story for everyone here in North America, but she bears the garments, the hopes, and many of the prayers of indigenous people. I invite us to pause right now for a moment of silence as we acknowledge these broken connections to the land and to the peoples who have endured and continue to endure being forced to flee. in joyful hope to celebrate your presence among us. Help us to find our quiet center and make room for you to enter. We know, Emmanuel, that you are with all those who call on you. Open us to each other's pain and help us stand with each other and join you in mutual respect and caring. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. 
When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. This is the time of year when many of us celebrate Our Lady of Guadalupe. And even in a pandemic, millions of people engaged in a pilgrimage on December 12th, so this Sunday, that gathered them together at the shrine of Our Lady in Mexico City. Millions more lit candles, sang songs, and prayed throughout the Catholic and particularly the Mexican heritage world. Perhaps most importantly, they, as we did here just now, heard this gospel text proclaimed and held it close to heart. And then the questions rush in as does the sheer wonder of this mystery. How is it that God chose to incarnate? And how is it, in doing so, God chose to be born of a humble peasant woman, to break into human history, to rupture time? Not to mention to do so as an infant, that most vulnerable and powerless of all human beings. Notice what is happening here. Mary has rushed off to Elizabeth to share her good news, but let's just think about that for a moment. How is this good news? Mary's a single mother, unwed, a woman from a marginalized and oppressed community. Perhaps like many of us who need that community, she rushes off to her close cousin Elizabeth, and as Elizabeth hears Mary, She's filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately recognizes what God is doing. She cries out in a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So we have here two pregnant women. And these two women pregnant in surprising ways. Mary, unwed, and Elizabeth, long beyond the age of bearing. Were I in their situation, I'm not sure how easily I would utter the words of Elizabeth. And yet, Elizabeth's response, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, is one most Catholics now know so thoroughly that we can recite it without conscious thought as it's at the center of the prayer we call the Hail Mary. It's a response of joy and proclamation joy for Mary and recognition of the Savior that Mary bears. In the story, we also learn that at this very same moment, Elizabeth's infant son, still in her womb, has leapt for joy. He too immediately recognizes the Lord and moves in joy, proclaiming his recognition in the only way infants in the womb can do. God is with them in a very tangible way, and their response is not fear, but joy. Joy to be shared, to be proclaimed. This is Mary's response too. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. So here again, joy and proclamation. I don't know how much you know about Roman Catholics, and indeed, we are such a huge and global and diverse community that it is dangerous to make broad generalizations, but I'm gonna venture one anyway. Roman Catholics like to think in analogies. We like to do our theology in incarnational ways. 
we think and we move sacramentally. Hearing this text over the centuries, our response has often been very similar, joy and proclamation. And that proclamation has come in practice, in traditions and patterns of moving that are deeply embodied. One of the clusters of practices, one of the ways of making sense of this text, has been to rehearse it, to imagine our way into what it means, what it feels like. The traditions associated with Our Lady of Guadalupe are one such form of imaginative practice. So guessing that maybe you don't know the story, I'm hoping you're going to give me a minute to share it with you. So the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe begins on the top of a very cold and windy mountain in the heart of December. A Nahuatl present, Juan Diego, is trudging yet again over a mountain pass as he struggles to feed his family and care, find a way to survive in the midst of all that is going on around him. He's a Christian, but he's not a member of the wealthy and powerful Christian community who controls the surrounding region. He's a peasant, and his native language is Nahuatl, not the Spanish of the conquistadors. So on one of the journeys over the mountain pass, he encounters a glowing young woman dressed, this is very important, dressed in the robes of his people, bearing the pregnancy sash of his people, and speaking his native language. He sees her, and he knows who she is, the mother of our Lord. She asks him to go to the bishop and to tell the bishop to build a church right on the spot where she's speaking to him. I can imagine many responses I might make, many things I might think were I to have such a situation. What would your response be? Juan Diego doesn't do what I might do, which would be to run away in fear or to refuse to believe what I'm seeing. Instead, he responds with joy and with proclamation. He immediately works his way towards the bishop and does his best to argue his way into the bishop's presence. The bishop, as many such people in power are wont to do, doesn't recognize Juan Diego as a bearer of an important message. All he sees is what he knows to see, a peasant spouting nonsense. He throws him out, ignoring the message. All right, the next day, the woman again appears to Juan Diego, and again Juan Diego trudges over the cold mountain pass and pushes his way into the bishop's presence. Yet again, he is ignored. On the third day, hear the resonance there? On the third day, Juan Diego is in deep despair as the glowing woman approaches him yet again. How can he, a poor peasant, make the bishop understand? He does not doubt Mary's presence, but he doubts his own ability to proclaim her message in a manner in which it will be heard. And at that moment, Juan Diego sees a huge abundance of roses growing near her, roses of all colors and an abundance that's miraculous for the depths of December on this very cold mountain pass. Mary asks him to gather up the roses and take them with him when he next speaks to the bishop. So Juan Diego gathers them up and carries them to the bishop. And this time, as he once again tells the bishop to build a church on the mountain pass, a church for all the Nahuatl peoples to gather in, he throws open his cloak and the roses pour onto the ground in front of the bishop and the assembled community. But not only the roses, a miraculous sign in the midst of winter, but imprinted on the length and breadth of his cloak what is called a tilma, you might have heard that term, is the very image of the woman he has encountered. Beauty and abundance, patience and persistence. And this sign finally breaks open the hard heart of the bishop and a church is built into which all of the Nahuatl peoples are welcomed. As this story has been shared over the centuries, for it's believed that Juan Diego lived in the 1530s, it has fired the imagination of the Catholic Church and indeed many other Christian communities who have told it. Its resonance with the gospel, particularly the profound conviction that God embraces those most humble, those most at the margins, has kept hope alive in multiple communities of people, including many who have been hurt or silenced 
by institutional religious authorities. And let's remember that we here in this chapel are institutional religious authorities. Even those of us who are staff or students or those of us who tend the institution, we inhabit religious authority. Are we open to the profound beauty to be encountered on the margins? Can we hear those voices? My friend and now retired colleague, Gracia Grindle, wrote of the distinction between proclamation and story in this way, and I quote, in proclamation, one is directly addressed. In stories, the listener is brought into the world of the story through identification. And so they now have the experience of the story and have enlarged their own imagination and experience. The gospel proclaims to us God's love, a love so deep and so wide that God became incarnate in that most vulnerable and powerless of human beings, a newborn infant. We Catholics and many other Christians hear that proclamation and we tell this additional story, the story of Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe, a story that reminds us that God loves the most vulnerable and powerless. And as Mary's song, further on in Luke, beyond the passage we heard today, reminds us, God has thrown down the rulers from their thrones but lifted up the lowly. The hungry God has filled with good things the rich God has sent away empty. The gospel breaks us open, draws us into identification beyond our institutional power and into God's power, urges us to joy, prompts proclamation. The story of Our Lady of Guadalupe invites us to personal recognition. Rather than seeing what we presume already to know, something that institutional authorities are all too often prone to, can we enter into the mystery of God's incarnation? Can we open up our knowing and maybe come to see in new ways? We rejoice in the incarnation in the heart of that mystery we proclaim Christ's presence. We hear the proclamation of Mary and Elizabeth, and we imagine ourselves into the story of Juan Diego and Our Lady of Guadalupe. Can you see yourself in this story? Who are you? Are you the tired and cold present struggling to make it over the mountain pass? Are you the arrogant and imperious bishop, the religious leader who sees what they know rather than being open to new knowing that might change what you can see? Maybe you're simply a bystander in the bishop's court. Whoever you are, this story invites us to open up to the mystery of God. Can we do that? Can we open ourselves to the incarnation, to God appearing in the most unlikely of places? To God becoming human as a newborn infant and to the beauty of infants, even in the most degrading and oppressive of places? A beauty that surely calls out to us and demands our love. Entering the mystery changes how we know and thus changes what we can see. In this Advent season, as the bitter winds blow around us, not simply the weather outside this building, but also the winds of pandemic, of loss, of despair, of treason, God's love opens us through the mystery of the Incarnation. We need to face the fear of being broken open, to know and to see in new ways. We need to see the hope that lies even in the bleakness, and we need to be open to the beauty that is all around us, the beauty that dominance might refuse to see. But the incarnation demands that we know and thus love. To return to the text, Elizabeth says, Blessed are you who believed that was what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary says, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. We need, in the midst of this winter, in the midst of our despair, to live deeply into this proclamation and to allow its joy to spill over into our lives and our actions. 
Amen. As we await the coming of Christ, we pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Oyenos mi Dios, oyenos mi Dios. Listen to your people, oyenos mi Dios. Oyenos mi Dios, oyenos mi Dios. Listen to your people, oyenos mi Dios. hope help us recognize the flowers in the snow show us the ways that you are working in the world and in our lives keep inviting us into your work and give us the perseverance and courage to pursue justice and peace in this world oyenos mi dios oyenos mi dios peace, we are troubled by the suffering in this world. We are troubled by grief, by anger, by destruction, by exploitation, and by injustice. Thank you for reminding us through your servant Mary that this is not your way, that the powerful will be cast down from their thrones and the lowly will be lifted up, that the hungry will be filled with good things while the wealthy will be sent away empty. Oyenos mi Dios. Oye nos mi Dios, oye nos mi Dios, listen to your people, oye nos mi Dios. God of joy, thank you for your incarnation. Thank you for dwelling in human bodies. Thank you for the joy of new life. And as we lift up the brown-skinned, indigenous American Mary, we also lift up all families expecting new life, particularly those families facing hardship, seeking refuge, or experiencing difficulties related to pregnancy, and especially families of color. May their needs be met, be met, O God, our provider, and may the joy of new birth be restored. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Listen to your people. Oyenos, mi Dios. God of love, like a rose, you wrap us in the soft petals of your gentle comfort, and you spur us on with thorns of conviction. We thank you that you listen to your people. Listen to the prayers of the people gathered in this space, of those joining us online, and of the whole host of saints gathered on earth and in heaven. We especially lift up Beverly Wallace at the death of her mother. For Sue, David, Kristen, Sandy, and all for whom we pray, surround them with your love. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos mi Dios, oyenos mi Dios, listen to your people, oyenos mi Dios. Our souls magnify the Lord and our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. Following in the footsteps of your servant Mary, may we be filled with eager expectation and may we show up to our neighbors in love and service. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Listen to your people. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Oyenos, mi Dios. Listen to your people. Oyenos, mi Dios. 
gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us in the words from the New Zealand prayer book, written by and for the Maori peoples. Please stand. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings, your commonwealth of peace and freedom, sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. We invite you to come up as we rejoice 
in knowing the world is about to turn and receive a rose as a sign of peace and mutual caring. So the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. So please come forward. Yeah, that's my interpreter. You're going to use the average. 